So far, we've seen from its peak house prices in the UK down about 4% from their peak, which was late summer last year. We expect internally that there's another 10% to go. We think about 14, 15% will be the impact of these interest rate increases. And so many people would call that a crisis. I think it, a lot of it depends on the degree, as I say, of people falling into negative equity and being forced to or losing their hats. So I'm sure you all have noticed prices have been rising at a ridiculous clip here in the UK. In particular, the culprits have been food and energy. If you look to sugar prices, they are up 50% from where they were a year ago. It's why interest rates have been skyrocketing, which of course is squeezing those of us who own homes and have mortgages. So how long is it going to stay this way? Will interest rates keep going up? Will the housing market crash? Today, we're going to be talking to a leading economist here in the UK to understand what's happening with inflation and see if there's any ways of beating it. Chief Economist at Investment Bank, Pamuel Gordon, and Times Columnist, I'd like to welcome Simon French. Simon, welcome. Thank you, Marcus. Pleasure to join you again. So let's jump straight into it then. The latest UK inflation figures for May created quite a stir, with CPI rising to 8.7%, and core inflation, which excludes the really volatile stuff like energy and food, up at 7.1%. So do you want to explain why these figures are so concerning? Well, in very simplistic terms, the Bank of England has a inflation target had prices rising at 2% a year. So those aforementioned figures are close to four times that level in terms of the core measure, more than four times when you look at the headline measure. And although, uh, not to prejudge where we're going to go in this podcast, although that those levels will come down uh, and if that one can be pretty confident looking at energy prices and food prices around the world. At the moment, those are very, very difficult um, economic conditions for a lot of households on a fixed or a low income where uh, big parts of their consumer basket, the things they have to buy week to week, have gone up a combined 20 to 25 percent since the start of the pandemic. Okay, so the stuff we really, really can't avoid avoid buying has gone up by a quarter since since the, the pandemic. And why is it such a problem here in the UK? Because of course we've heard in America, you know, they had a bit of a problem too, but that seems to be coming under control there. So why is the UK so bad? Well, it is. A complex picture, but let's try and simplify it a little. First thing to say is, even though you are right, in the United States, inflation has come down somewhat faster. They still have an inflation problem with inflation at double their target at 4% and core inflation, so stripping out those volatile elements at more than 5%. But you are right. The UK is seen as something of an outlier amongst major economies. Well, looking at our the latest data um, for May, the average G G7 um, inflation rate was about five and a half percent. So the UK around eight and a half percent is is three hundred basis points or three percent higher. Why? Well, there's a lot of explanations, um, and it's not as simple as just the gas price. Although the gas price and our reliance, our over reliance on a very elevated gas price is making up a considerable contribution to that. But there'll be some of your listeners who will have heard, and you've mentioned core inflation, that strips out the volatile energy component and it takes more of its cue from, from wages. Well, there is also a problem of a very tight labour market in the UK. There's more than 1 million vacancies in the UK economy. And unemployment is still only, although it's ticked up a little bit, only 4%. That's giving workers the bargaining power to ask for pay awards. Not every worker, not in every sector, but across the economy, wages are growing, depending on the public sector or the private sector, between 5 to 8% a year. And that is, if you like, 
embedding UK inflation and some of the other major economies, their labour markets are not reacting in quite the same way. What about Brexit? Has that played any part in the inflation picture? Yes, it has. Um, Brexit, as we've spoken about before, Marcus, is a very polarising issue and a lot of people use it either as a as a reason why everything is bad and everything is the fault of Brexit or, or try and excuse everything away. The reality is more nuanced. Um, if you look at the elements of what the UK consumes that is imported from the European Union, those appear to have gone up a little bit faster than similar imports from the rest of the world, suggesting that those new barriers to, to trade, and but it has to be said, not all of those barriers have come in. There's still um, import checks to come in later this year that may push inflation higher as a result of Brexit. But it is playing a role, and that is at the what we know would describe as trade friction, so the, the additional cost of trading with the EU where we're heavily reliant for imports of the likes of foodstuffs. But also the relative weakness of the pound amplifies the cost of those imports. Now, the pound has recovered a little bit um, in, in recent weeks, recent months, partly on the expectation the interest rates will have to be higher in the UK. But generally speaking, the pound is still about 10% lower than it was before the Brexit vote. And that at the margin makes imported goods into the UK more expensive. Now, I mentioned briefly that interest rates have been rising and we saw the 13th hike quite recently to, and a big hike, a 0.5% hike to 5%. The base rate is now at 5%. So, you know, that seems, you know, quite a lot of hikes and it's been going on a little while, but it still hasn't really been taming inflation in, I suppose, in a, in a big way. What, why is that? Is it just taking time to work through the economy? Yes, uh, what you're describing there is something that economists would call the, the transmission mechanism, although to cut out the jargon, it's the lag time between when the Bank of England raises interest rates and when it has its impact in terms of reducing the amount of money available to households and businesses to spend on goods, which by extension starts to bring the prices that those uh, businesses can charge if it doesn't bring them down, it certainly limits their ability to keep raising them. What we've noticed in the United Kingdom is that the initial pass through to people who have savings from higher interest rates on their savings accounts, particularly those who are prepared to shop around or indeed lock away their savings for a number of years, now widely offering four, often five percent, that is rather quicker in terms of giving households additional resources, additional cash, than the additional costs on their debt pile. Often we think of this in terms of mortgages, but it's also loans, credit cards, and in the case of companies, the company debt that they may take out. One of those features is that in recent years, a lot of households have locked in those low rates, two-year, five-year fixes at 2%, if they're lucky, even lower than that. Now, those will roll off over the next few years, and very painfully so, and we're already seeing examples of households who are spending thousands more per year servicing their mortgages. But at an aggregate level across the economy, that hasn't really played out. So that is that lag, that transmission mechanism we're talking about. So a lot of interest rate increases, but the full effect has yet to be felt, but it make no mistake, it's coming. I mean, how long are we talking? Well, historically, economists model this as 18 months to 24 months, so up to two years. And interest rates started rising back at the end of 2021. So even that first increase has still got a way to run through. But you're right, there have been 13 increases, and those really won't take effect until probably 2025, the middle part of 2025. So um, that's the time lag historically the way of econ economists have modelled. But I know, Marcus, you're very much a student of where economists make errors, uh, and this economist is not immune to those errors. We have to be mindful that the modern economy is very different to the type of economy we had the last time interest rates went up on anything like this scale. 
uh, the dissemination of information, of data to allow households to adjust is probably much quicker. Social media and the like wasn't around in large form in the mid 2000s, the last time we had an interest rate cycle like this. But, and that may suggest things respond quicker, the lag is shorter. But I've already mentioned that a lot of mortgages are now fixed term, when in the mid 2000s they were floating rate. And when the floating rate, uh, those interest rate costs land immediately on households. If you take it, let's say you were very, very fortunate and took out a five year fix back at the end of 2021 when interest, when mortgages were widely available at between one and 2%, you're insulated from all this pain until the back end of 2026. So the very lever that the Bank of England's trying to pull to, you know, let's be candid, take money out of your pocket and bringing inflation down by reducing your spending power, that isn't going to hit you in terms of that mortgage product for another three and a half years. Mm, interesting. So do you think, I mean, what what is going to be the impact on the housing market as this plays out? Do you think we are facing a bit of a crisis in the housing market? Oh, crisis is a very emotive term. Uh, it depends how you define such things. I mean, I would personally define a a crisis as a scenario where people are losing their homes uh, in a situation of negative equity where they can't service their mortgage. Now, a lot of that is linked to whether we get considerable unemployment. And I mentioned the strength of the labour market. Uh, and so far, that really hasn't been a, a function of, of, of this economic cycle. If you, if you want a job in the UK, you can largely find a job, which suggests the housing market's pretty uh, robust and insulated from that. But if you are looking at housing as a, either a, uh, directly as an investment asset or indirectly as, as part of your wealth, I think you should condition yourself for a quite considerable fall in the value of that asset. So. So far, we've seen from its peak house prices in the UK down about 4% from their peak, which was late summer last year. We expect internally that there's another 10% to go. We think about 14, 15% will be the impact of these interest rate increases. And so many people would call that a crisis. Um, uh, I think it, a lot of it depends on the degree, as I say, of people falling into negative equity and being forced to or losing their house. Uh, many, particularly older le listeners, will remember negative equity in the early 1990s as that being a, a defining housing crisis. The good news there is that far fewer mortgages are have a loan-to-value level of 90 or indeed 100% plus. There's been a de-risking of the UK mortgage market. There's actually only 4% of the UK mortgage stock is more than 90% LTV, loan to value. And that suggests that although this is going to be a painful adjustment in terms of prices and the cost of servicing your mortgage, the, the number of people who are right on the tipping point with very, very little equity in their home to fall back on uh, is considerably less than the last time we played this kind of movie. Where do you see inflation going? I mean, you know, the, the Bank of England is forecasting that it will drop quite considerably over the course of the next year. Is it is it possible? But, you know, <laughs> you sort of alluded to, we know that forecasts can be wrong and, 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 uh, and the bank have been wrong quite recently. Is there a possibility that it just doesn't drop and that this could get worse? Yeah, so, so not just the bank. I've been wrong. Pretty much the whole forecasting community, economic forecasting community, have been wrong. Um, uh, and you knew there was a but coming, didn't you? Um, but um, inflation has come down from its peak at more than 11% down to mid eights, as we are at the moment. So we're on a, a downward path. It's never a straight line. Economic data doesn't operate like that. Um, but do we know enough about what are known as wholesale costs for energy and food. These are costs of buying the raw commodity, be it gas, be it electricity, be it corn, be it sugar, you mentioned sugar. These prices have come down in 
wholesale markets and in, in markets where the raw material is traded. Does that translate with a lag, there's that word again, lag, through to the prices that people are paying and therefore the inflation rates? Yes, I'm pretty confident it will. Um, we're already seeing signs anecdotally of supermarkets saying, look, we can start to bring prices down as we start to recontract with our suppliers. We've also seen shipping rates around the world, which were very, very elevated as a lot of households around the world are able to consume services, leisure events. They bought goods, put a lot of strain on the global shipping network, allowing prices to be very elevated. Again, those have come right down. So in answer to your question, those really strong leading indicators on gas, on food, on shipping suggest that inflation will come down. But the debate is probably not whether it will come down, but whether it will come down enough to A, stop interest rates going up a lot more, and then B, potentially a situation where they start to, to be cut. And I think that is far more open to question. I, I sit in the camp where while inflation will moderate, I still think it will stick around like something of a bad smell for quite a few years because we have had such a big shock to prices that those prices are going to continue to adjust and offer an up, upward adjust over the next few years. Do you, I mean, there's been some questions banded around about whether or not companies have been profiteering. You know, they call it greedflation. Uh, do you believe this? Have you seen this? Do you think this is the case? So there's some very decent evidence uh, in the United States and in mainland Europe of profiteering, um, cited by both you know, lawmakers in the United States and um, European Central Bank. The UK picture is slightly more, more um, open to question, actually. While profit margins in the first quarter of the year, the latest data we have, did pick up, um, they haven't picked up to levels that uh, are inconsistent with the long-term average. Um, and workers are also taking an increasingly large share of economic output as well. So if one thinks that you know, the distribution is largely between workers and profits, there isn't strong evidence of profiteering, with the one exception, and the one exception is North Sea oil and gas companies and the associated energy companies where there are very clearly super normal profits. And that has been one of the reasons why a windfall tax has been levied by the government is that those are very clear super normal profits. Let's get on to sort of how we go about dealing with this. And I think, you know, when you know people are thinking about what to do with their cash, the sort of the, the classic thing is either saving or investing it. And I was just having a look at some of the, the, the recent sort of interest rates on, on money facts and you can get a you know two year fixed rate of six point one five percent uh on your savings. Uh, or you could decide to take some risk. And you know it does involve risk, and, and put your money in the stock markets. What would you say is the better approach, or you know, what 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 things are there to think about when you're considering those two options when it comes to beating inflation? So the, the first thing to say is, although six and a bit percent on uh, fixed term savings uh, looks what we would describe as nominally attractive, so the number looks attractive, you are right. If you're trying to beat inflation, uh, that on the face of it does not keep pace with inflation. Uh, I would argue actually over the next two years, inflation is probably going to average less than six. So you probably, uh, to be fair, uh, you're getting a slight positive adjusted inflation return. But what you have to ask yourself, and I would always um, encourage anybody considering where to put their their savings to, to ask themselves is what is your 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 appetite for risk and your need for that money back in short order and if you have a low appetite for risk and need that money back relatively quickly then the attractiveness of some of the savings rates on cash at the moment will and we know already it is influencing savers to put more and more cash into those products. However, over the long term, you have a better chance of beating inflation, or have historically, uh, by 
putting your excess cash in in risk, slightly riskier assets, equities being the the obvious ones, so shares, whose return has beaten inflation over the long term. And but it, but clearly, you know, that that's a more volatile asset class. It could go up, it could go down, and the moment you might want to sell might not be the moment that the stock market is one in one of its up cycles. And in that environment, but but if you are prepared to sort of see that through, then I think that remains the 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 most, the best, if you like, evidence based way of beating inflation over the long term. What is it, it? You know, what is the mechanism behind why shares do seem to beat inflation over over the long run? What is it about companies that enable the prices of you know pieces of that company to be able to? exceed that that rate of inflation yeah in in economics terms it's um innovation it's productivity so if you give a company a pound and that company can through its intellectual property through its workers through its capital uh, generate um Profits, returns. It can, it can, it can innovate. It can, it can produce what economists would call the sort of almost the secret source of modern economies. It's its productivity growth. It's, um, it's innovating to produce effectively more with less, or more with the same. Um, and and that is why, if you are exposed to investments that that leverage that, that try and bring together workers and capital together with innovation. Historically, those companies have managed to outstrip prices and give you a an excess return. So it's because that they can produce profits, those profits rise, and the share prices are, are more or less linked to the profits of those companies. Therefore, that's why you should, you should be able to produce these inflation, inflation busting returns. Uh, that's absolutely right. And, and the key also, and it would be remiss of me not to say that, is um, part of taking on more risk, and there's been a lot of debate in UK financial markets as to whether we have um, de-risked uh, or, or sort of encouraged retail savers and also institutional savers to be very averse to risk. But if you take on that risk, there is no guarantee of a single company or a couple of companies being the ones that do innovate. Uh, there is profit is the you know, is the reward for taking risk, and some of that risk will mean that companies will fail. Uh, companies will try and innovate, and their market will disappear, or someone will innovate better than them. And this is why the other golden rule, if you like, uh, of investing is to to diversify, have a uh, a, a relatively large number of um, stakes in those those growth companies that can boost, can deliver inflation, boosting returns, because you will inevitably have some duds. Uh, not and none of us have perfect foresight, and we can know which are the duds and which are uh, the winners. And um, your best way of um, getting exposure to those is to, to to have you know a quite significant number of, of, of different um if you like to put a sporting analogy a number of horses in the race and i suppose my final question really wants to you know just then look a bit at the stock market you know so i mean i can see your arguments there around why you know companies at least offer you a, a good opportunity to beat inflation it's it's not guaranteed but if you do it in a diversified way then you get rid of some of those you know excessive risks that might exist by investing in individual companies so diversified portfolios are good but you're sort of you're in the stock market then and i suppose some people will be thinking okay right well stock markets fly up or they go down and, and I'm sort of a bit worried about that at the moment things seem pretty uncertain so you know what what would be what would you say would be the direction from here if a inflation gets worse or b inflation gets better as I suppose many economists expect it to, to kind of do so the, the, the first thing to say uh, on that is that 
we tend to look at valuing companies on um, multiples of their earnings. What does that mean? You know, if if you've got a um, the price you'll pay for a share is probably best judged by not the price in you know, 100p, 200p, 400p, but it's it's the ratio of that price to its earnings, to its profits. And um, when you look at particularly UK and particularly European shares at the moment, what you see is those are very close to their lows, their, their all-time lows, if you particularly in the small and mid cap part of so the smaller and mid-sized companies. So less the case with the large companies. Historically, if you've bought at these points when um, uh, when valuations are, let's call it what they are, cheap, then you've done better. The reason why I'm sort of caveating what I say is because I don't think there's a great wisdom in trying to time the market all the time. So try to put money in when you think it's cheap and take it out when it's expensive. I mean, generally speaking, we're not very good at that. But with the benefits of, if you like, hindsight looking back, those periods where you know the, the economic clouds have been very dark and the valuations of companies have been very low have historically been very good times to allocate. That, that should be part of an investor thinking right now, albeit the evergreen strategy is to keep drip feeding in all the time and taking the sort of the that judgment element sort of out of the equation. So if we look at metrics that enable us to assess markets and and uh, at different periods of time, we can sort of have a look at the value that you kind of are buying in at relatively. And what we see, as you say, in particular in the UK and, and Europe and in in the slightly smaller size companies, is that they that they appear cheap right now relative to history. And when we when we also go back to history, when we look at times, you know, when people have invested during those times, that has tended, although there's obviously no guarantees, to be a good time to invest. Because, you know, like like anything that you buy cheaply and, you know, one day it was a lot more expensive, the next day it's a bit cheaper, you, you're, you're receiving some good value for that. And when it comes to stock markets, that's that tends to be a, a, a good time to invest rather than if they've they've risen quite high and they appear expensive yeah i mean we can't go through an investing podcast uh, without mentioning the sort of the doyen of uh, global investing warren buffett and of course he says uh you know um be greedy when other are fear others are fearful and be fearful when others are greedy and then so he is slightly more eloquently and, and far more successfully than i uh indicating there's at times when people are really worried about the economic uh, impact of rising interest rates, when valuations are pretty cheap. That's actually when a, a really successful you know, individual over many economic cycles has felt the most emboldened to go out there and, um, and, and, and try and get those inflation beating returns. Well, on that note, Simon French, thanks very much. My pleasure, Marcus. 